Good evening. Uh, welcome to the University of Tennessee uh, College of Architecture and Design, Robert B. Church Lecture Series. Uh, tonight's lecture is also co-organized uh, by the American Institute of Architects, uh, AAA East Tennessee chapter. I am very excited to present tonight's uh, guest lecture, Karen Britt Meyer. Uh, architect Karen Britt Meyer uh, is the founding principal of the Studio Pacifica and an accessibility consulting firm based in Seattle, Washington. Her good fight has consistently focused on supporting equity and full inclusion for persons with disabilities. In 2019, she was chosen as the national winner of the AIA Whitney M. Young Jr. Award, a prestigious award given to an architect who embody social responsibilities and actively addresses and relevant issues. In the award's 48 years history, she was the first recipient honored for their work on the area of civil rights for persons with disabilities. Brett Meyer was also appointed by President Barack Obama to the United States Access Board, a position she retains today uh, in her studio, Studio Pacifica, Seattle.com. Uh, for the attendees, uh, if you have questions, please type it in the Q&A section anytime during the lecture and we'll address them after the lecture. Allow me to welcome Karen Britt Meyer. It's great to have you and thank you for joining us tonight. Accessible architecture is good architecture. It creates places um, for all people, makes everybody feel comfortable and welcomed. When I started in architecture, I wasn't really interested in focusing on my disability, but on what I loved, which was making things. As time went on, I discovered that um, I had a particular perspective that not everybody shared. <laughs> Maybe you could even say a line of sight that was um, unique. I think architects want to make things accessible. They may just need some guidance on how to, how the best way is to do that. As we age, our abilities all change and we will benefit from those things that we call, you know, accessible features. So really this is it for everybody. People might say, the city doesn't work for me. Well, what's the best way to make impact on that, right? Is to be involved in the design of our cities. And I think architecture is like the best way to do that. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> it's always kind of funny to see yourself on video, um, but I'm so excited to be here today uh, to talk to you a little bit about my work and accessibility and why, uh, why it's so important and such an exciting field to be in. So I'm presenting, well, hi, I'm Karen. <laughs> I am presenting to you uh, today from my home in Seattle. And I acknowledge that I am a guest on this land, home of the Duwamish and Coast Salish tribes. I'm gonna to start today by sharing three questions that I often get asked. What was life like for a person with disability prior to the ADA? What buildings or places do I think maybe go beyond, above and beyond the regulations? And what still needs to be done to assure great access? Well, first, oh, what was life like prior to the ADA? <clears throat> well, for many of us, people with disabilities 40 or 50 years ago, we assumed that we had to adapt to the built environment. It wasn't going to change for us. So, but my first kind of inclination that maybe that didn't need to be true actually was when I started architecture school. Walked into my first day of design studio. And as you can imagine, I was faced with a sea of tall drafting tables and stools back in the days where 
we actually did just draw. Um, and I'm thinking, ooh, tall, and I'm down here in my wheelchair. This is going to be tough. But my classmates are very creative. And at the end of studio, they all went out, bought some supplies, came back, pried the top off that drafting table, and built a new base. And now all of a sudden, I had a drafting table at my height. And I was able to do everything that all my classmates were able to do. So that was really my first example. Well, concrete example that changing my environment could change my abilities. So let's get into the slideshow. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, I'm hoping you're seeing history is about story. And stories about how things were. Stories about change and about how a particular change came to be. So what's the story behind the ADA and other groundbreaking legislation? So how do we get to where we are? Well, really, it's largely because people with disabilities acted. So what we're seeing is a picture here of World War II veterans. They, um, you know what? They were coming back from war with injuries, but they were living. And they were like, wait, well, we need to live a full life. They ended up advocating for the rights, uh, for the um, benefits that they were promised as veterans, and they got those. But that, that movement started the process of more people asking for rights for people with disabilities. First, it started with the parents, parents of children with disabilities advocating for their kids to get an education, just to go to school and get other basic services. Well, then those kids grew up and they began to advocate for their rights and they wanted more. By the 60s and 70s, they were advocating for rights to transportation, education, uh, employment, federal buildings, and the list goes on. In 1990, you may be aware, it was the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, <clears throat> which was groundbreaking. But that was 30, almost 31 years ago. It'll be 31 years this summer in July. And there's still more to go, right? Today, people with disabilities are continuing to advocate both professionally and personally for changes that support true diversity, equity, inclusion, and full accessibility. You know, we're not done yet. And I want to just make a pitch. Um, I hope that you will uh, get a chance to see, if you haven't already, an amazing documentary on the disability rights movement. It's called Crip Camp. It's currently playing on Netflix and it's actually up for, I think it's a, an Academy Award for documentary, which is so exciting. It's just a really powerful um, explanation of where the disability rights came, uh, movement came from. And you know what? We're all just regular people. It's such a great, I, I really encourage you to see it. So, <clears throat> you know, disability, uh, people with disabilities might be considered a minority, but there's, a, we're a really, really big minority. <clears throat> um, one out of four adults in the U.S. have a disability. That's like 61 million adults. That doesn't count kids, anybody under the age of 18. And it also doesn't really acknowledge the diversity of people that benefit from accessible features. You know, like parents pushing strollers 
are benefiting from uh, disability features. And boy, that number is gonna go up as our population continues to age. So what exactly is a disability defined as? Well, there is a legal definition, physical or mental condition that limits a person's movement or activities, <clears throat> and also uh, can limit their senses, such as sight or hearing. And there are words that some people use, uh, maybe in a legal context, like disadvantaged or handicapped, although those are not uh, considered to be um, the best words to use in conversation about someone. I like to think that when people hear the word disability, that they think of it as a, a design opportunity, something that's going to spark your imagination to be creative. Um, because really what you're trying to overcome are environmental barriers. And an environmental barrier is uh, could be as simple as a set of stairs, uh, but it can also be uh, a sort of a temporary or situational condition. So um, I'm hard of hearing. I wear hearing aids. In a quiet environment where it was just you and me in a, in a room having a conversation, I uh, function very effectively with my hearing aids. If and I'm in a very noisy restaurant with a lot of background noise, I am really dead in the water and I am acutely aware of my hearing loss. So to me, that environment is disabling, even so that it doesn't actually really indicate that I, as a person, have a challenge. It's that the environment is not supporting me. And there are lots of different terms that people use around the idea of accessibility. <laughs> accessibility is really kind of a code-related term but people talk about human-centered design, uh, universal design, or inclusive design. These are all terms that indicate that we're putting the person first and trying to find ways to support, uh, to, to create designs that um, amplify the abilities of an individual. So <clears throat> you might know, or maybe not, that there's been a lot of change over time in the regulations that affect the built environment. Why would that be, right? Because people with disabilities were just the same as we've always been. Well, a lot of it has to do with the differences in the devices that we now use to access our environment. So wheel mobility in particular has changed dramatically. If you think back to that picture, of the World War II veterans. They were all sitting in pretty much the same wheelchair. Um, when I was a kid, there was basically one wheelchair manufacturer and wheelchairs came in maybe a handful of sizes. Nowadays, wheelchairs are custom fit to you in particular, like kind of like you might uh, buy a pair of shoes uh, that fits your feet perfectly. Um, and they, the um, types of devices range from sort of the second one in from the left is a lightweight manual chair um, that would be custom fit very closely to your body. Um, on the very far right, you're seeing a power chair with um, that elevates and sometimes they recline and um, it can get much larger in footprint. And the building regulations are now having to sort of adjust to the differences in those devices. And by the way, the one on the very left, that's a scooter. I've driven one of those and they have terrible turning radius. It's like driving bumper cars if you're trying to get into a public toilet room. Oh my gosh. So um, really we need to think about how people are using these devices and how they interact with their environment. So, as I said before, everybody wants to live a full life. And that's really why the laws were passed, was in order to let people be able to participate in society. So the very first legislation that was fought hard and long for 
was the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 504. And what made this very um, significant was that it prohibited discrimination on the basis of disability in a variety of uh, programs and facilities run by the federal government. So anything that uh, got fin financial support from the federal government, um, employment by the federal government, or the employment practices of someone who is contracted to the federal government, those were all covered by Section 504 and actually continue to do so today. So if you were to design a new classroom building on your university campus, your university receives federal funds somewhere, I'm sure they're getting a grant for research or for who knows what. And that means anything that's built on your university campus would be covered by Section 504 and therefore would be required to be fully accessible. So that was a very significant piece of legislation but it didn't quite go far enough, right? So the move was to get something that affected all buildings in the United States. And that was the ADA and that passed in 1990 and it was updated in 2010. And it also prohibits uh, discrimination um, uh, against people with disabilities, but this time in a broader context. So it's all employment opportunities in state and local government services, public accommodations, and a public accommodation is anything um, that welcomes the public in. So it could be your daycare center or your movie theater, the doctor's office, um, the grocery store, all those are public accommodations. It also covers commercial facilities, transportation and telecommunication. And this was absolutely the broadest um, spectrum of areas that would allow people with disabilities to be fully engaged in their communities. So one thing that was really different about the ADA is that it actually applied to existing buildings, not just new ones. So, if you had an existing building when, or if you owned an existing building in 1992, when this went into effect, you were required to assess your building to determine what barriers existed. You had to prioritize how you were gonna remove those barriers. Um, certainly it makes sense to think about sort of how people get in. So maybe the first barrier you would remove would be getting in the front door and then maybe getting to the area of primary function. So if you were doing a movie theater, you would, can people get in the front door? It, can people get to the movie area? Then next, maybe to the toilet rooms or to the place where you buy your popcorn. So um, thinking about setting priorities for how to remove those barriers and then Anything that is fast and easy to do, like maybe you have doorknobs on all the doors. We're putting in lever handles as a quick and easy barrier removal thing. That should be done right away. So that was required of building owners when the ADA passed. Now, the hard part is not very many of them did it. The ADA does also impact new construction and very much the same as building code. It sets up a standard that says anything that you build new must be fully accessible. And then there's a small list of exceptions, places that maybe are deemed not required to be fully accessible. But all building uses must be accessible. Um, you know, one great example that people always argue with me about are uh, fire stations, right? There's, by definition, a firefighter has to be able to be strong enough to, I don't know, run up a flight of stairs with a huge big roll of, of um, fire hose on their back. So they have to be pretty agile, 
pretty strong. These are not likely to be people with disabilities, right? So we don't need to make that fire station accessible. The important thing to remember is that you are making inserting accessibility for the life of the building. And since when you build a building, you hope it's gonna be there 50, maybe even a hundred years, that fire station may not stay a fire station over the life of it over its life. So I mean, in my community, there are a number of fire stations that are now, I don't know, community centers or um, you know, are in private in uh, being used by for private companies. Those spaces need accessibility. So isn't it better to build that in at the beginning? Yes. So <clears throat> as I said, new construction should be 100% accessible. Now, uh, where do you go to find information? Because today we're gonna talk about um, sort of big picture ideas, but we're also gonna talk a little bit about the details because really accessibility is in the details. Um, but I don't want you to have to like memorize any of this or try to remember numbers and stuff. The important thing is that you know where to go look for the right information. So I'm gonna encourage you, the one thing that you take away from today's lecture is this website. ADA.gov is the website set up by the Department of Justice to provide you with access to the documents that tell you what you need to know and how to make your buildings accessible. Uh, <clears throat> the important thing is to know which part of the ADA to look for. They're called titles. And um, if you're doing any projects that are in state and local government, uh, facilities, you would look at Title II. And if you're doing anything that has to do with public accommodations or commercial facilities, you're going to look in Title III. That's about the most important information that you're going to want to kind of memorize. Um, the other thing to know about the ADA is kind of different than a building code is <clears throat> Um, it doesn't always completely align with the building code in your state. Here in Washington, we are covered by uh, something called the International Building Code, and we have state amendments to that. And in some cases, our state regulations actually are more stringent than the ADA. So it's very important that when you start a project and you're gonna be thinking about the accessibility regulations that go along with it, that you look at both the federal requirements, which is the ADA and the state building code, compare them and pick the most stringent of each of the requirements. That's what you should be complying with. The other thing is, is that the ADA does differ from the building code <clears throat> because it really does cover more than just the facility. So if you're building a classroom building um, on, your, on your campus and um, the building code is going to address, like a, a friend of mine used to say, if you picked up the building and you turned it upside down and you shake, Anything that falls out is not covered by the building code. So furnishings, not covered by the building code. Uh, the um, um, soda pop machine, not covered by the building code because it's just plugged in. Well, here's the thing. The ADA actually does address some of those things. So there's a little bit more coverage um, on some non-fixed items that you would need to be paying attention and ensuring that even those things are 100% accessible. And when it comes to compliance, knowing if you are in compliant, again, 
it's a little different than the building code. The building code, your local jurisdiction is going to, you have to submit a set of plans, have them reviewed, and they're going to look for accessibility. And they're going to tell you, yep, you know, you checked all the boxes, you're, you've got a compliant project. Um, if you are building a building or an addition, they send inspectors out the local jurisdiction and they tell you whether or not you complied with the building code and you get a little certificate of occupancy. Unfortunately, there's nothing like that that ensures that you met the ADA until you find out perhaps that someone has complained. So it's very important to, and remember we talked about the fact that the building code and the ADA do not completely align. So even if the building department gives you like an okay to do something differently or something that they're gonna say, oh, you don't need to make that accessible you might still have that obligation under the federal regulations. So it's really good if you have a chance to bring someone on board for your projects who can check for that to be sure that you've gotten a fully compliant project. So, you know, I think that the ADA has actually changed architectural design in huge ways. And I think it's for the better. I'm gonna show you a couple of projects now that I think are just super fun and why I think they're really exciting. So this is, and many of them are, are projects that I worked on, but um, this is the Seattle City Hall. And one of the really, really cool things about this project is that it has this blue ramp, I'm sorry, blue bridge that connects um, over an atrium and I love bridges. So, you know, sometimes people say like, oh, you know, you put a big uh, sort of elaborate set of stairs up um, that to signify uh, that the entrance to a building is significant or um, that the, the, pra the, um, the process of moving through that space is, is um, significant or, or um, I don't know, I, I guess um, elaborate or whatever. Um, you know, I, I, as a lifelong wheelchair user, I kind of don't get the whole stair thing. I, I like at the top, you stand up there and you look down and maybe at the bottom you're looking up, maybe people at the top seem more powerful, I don't know. But the I think that bridges provide you with that same awesome experience, but it's equitable, right? Everybody can look over that edge and experience that atrium or that dramatic view or whatever. So I just, I really, I love, I love bridges. I found this on the web. Um, now, uh, this is it's clearly it, a beautiful and very sort of exciting pool, right? Not everybody can have something this beautiful, but this is a beautiful example of how to incorporate accessibility without it kind of screaming accessibility. Can you find the accessibility on this pool? On the left-hand image, I'm hoping you can see my cursor, you can see that there are these beautiful shallow ramps they come from the upper plaza uh, courtyard um, outside of this house down to this pool deck under the gazebo where the um, chairs are. But on the image on the right, can you see the ramp that goes down and the, the, this sort of plaza um, open space next to the pool is about 18 inches below the pool deck. That means a chair user could roll down there and make a horizontal transfer from the seat of their chair onto the pool deck, 
go for a swim, come back, transfer into their chair. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And absolutely seamless. I saw this um, at a presentation on accessible design and the uh, colleague who was sitting with me kept saying, I don't see how that's accessible. I saw it instantly because it's something I need and would benefit from. So accessible design doesn't need to be hit you over the head. It can be seen by the folks who need it. The other thing that's important to know is that sometimes as much as we want to, you can follow the accessibility rules and you know in the codes, but still not really get to fully inclusive. So right now we're looking at um, a, a, a speakeasy in Seattle, the deep dive. Um, and there is a, a requirement in the code that tells us that when you have a bar um, for eating or drinking, that you must have an accessible section of that bar. And so an accessible section would be no higher than 34 inches to the countertop, whereas a standard bar height is 42. So if you dropped one end of the bar, which is the most common way of creating an accessible bar, I'm sitting down here and all my friends are sitting up there. Not quite exactly the kind of fun experience that I would want to have. Well, we had a super um, sort of um, exciting um, opportunity in this particular project. The raw shell had a change in level in the floor. And we were able to set the bar so that one end of the bar is over the higher floor. And I, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. There's a couple of steps right here. And the second half of the bar, which is on the right, is at the higher height. Now, when I sit with my friends, I'm on the same eye level. Is that a win-win or what? Totally exciting. And a couple of people have pointed out to me that it's not clear in this picture, but there is a ramp that comes down on the very right um, if you can see my cursor and there's an opening behind this wall. So if you wanted to sit with your friends at the banquette, you can get in there, it's accessible. So it's just super fun space. So this is the Hunters Point Community Library. And um, this library got, it's, it's somewhat controversial. Um, it opened up, um, I think it was about two years ago. So it's very new <clears throat> and the design is very impressive and certainly got a lot of architectural press. Um, but it also got press around some other stuff that not so great. So if you can see in this picture, these bookshelves in this area of the library are accessible only by stairs. And there are some other places in the library that also are not on accessible routes. And that means that like, you know, if I wanted to get a new book to read on vacation, I would have to ask a librarian to go and sort of browse for me. So I think this flies in the face of access for all. So, I guess this brings the question to me, is a building great public architecture if not everybody can use it? Now here's a building to me is, is like kind of the opposite of that. This is the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, California. And that is a super fun ramp to roll down. I've done it. And oh my gosh, so fun. It's a lot of work to go up, but there are elevators, but the down is great. So what's the thing that made the creative difference here? Besides, of course, the very talented design team behind the project. Well, I would argue that it's that people with disabilities were intimately involved 
in the building's design process. This building is a home to many disability related organizations. And so they were able to really support the kind of core design of the project. I hope that this will encourage you in the future if you do a project with a really beautiful accessibility feature or maybe one not quite as dramatic as this, but still something creative. I'm hoping that you will pitch it to the architectural press because I think we need to see in the media more examples of great accessible design. Um, it's one way to be a great designer and a design activist. So the renovation of this new plaza at um, the University of New Mexico totally jumped out at me when I first saw this image because a singular design decision made it easy for people who are blind to move comfortably through the middle of this wide open space. And that is very unusual. So people who are blind need a tactile reference point in order to navigate through space. And most often that tactile reference point, it might be the intersection of a wall and a floor surface. It might be the edge of a curb or a planter, but almost always it requires, it's around the edge of an open space. So that means that someone trying to move through this space would have to go the long way around instead of taking a shortcut through the middle, like those of us with vision. But here, a tactile material was installed down the middle of the plaza and actually it forks so that you can go one way or the other. It contrasts in surface texture and in color and allows someone who uses a white cane to follow it and confidently move through space. This one difference resulted in a beautiful example of thoughtful access. And that brings us to another way of looking at difference. Um, it's important to remember that access is not just for people who use wheelchairs. It's about um, people who are unsteady on their feet. As I mentioned before, parents with strollers, people who are in the blindness or low vision community, and people who, have, who are hard of hearing or deaf. At its best, access is a multi-sensory experience. And um, here we are, this is the understory. It's an interpretive center under the Amazon spheres here in Seattle. And it invites everyone to experience all the exhibits in a multi-sensory way. And yes, people with disabilities were included in the design process. So difference isn't so different anymore. Um, can a mix of non-typical bodies be accommodated in public spaces? Well, mixed design and many others think so. What you're looking at here is an alternative to a typical sort of large scale um, assembly, occupancy, airport design type restroom. Without a doubt, you've started to see some of these changes already in the public space, but I wanna talk to you about why I think it's a critical change. This open space plan is based on the desire of people who are differently embodied to be accommodated in a more equitable and less stigmatizing way than having no choice but use the separate but equal accessible facilities that are often available in public spaces. Here you see inclusive design at its best. First, it's open space, large and able to accommodate people who use, require lots of space. It's safe, easy to use, provides generous turning radius. It welcomes all genders and there's choice available choice in the heights of your toilet, of your sinks, of your mirrors. It's really about diversity. And so here we're gonna just 
touch on, we've been talking about design and how architects can creatively address diverse needs, a great example of which is this um, apartment uh, mailroom in Brooklyn. But there's another point of diversity I'd like to address. When it comes to diversity, people with disabilities are practically invisible in architecture and related professions. I firmly believe that if our profession is committed to reaching the next level of design excellence, we need to change that. So how do we do that? Architecture schools need to make a dedicated effort to increase diversity by reaching out to and welcoming students with disabilities. Architecture firms must be encouraged to increase diverse perspectives by hiring and supporting the careers of architects with disabilities. And the AIA, an organization that represents its members, needs to make a significant commitment to changing this lack of representation through education and outreach. So I'm gonna ask you to think about that as we move on um, to our next section. Because as I said, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about how you can create a more accessible world and be both a good designer and a design activist. And it's really a lot about the details. So let's talk really quickly, because I think I want to be sure I keep us on schedule. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about like how people actually use the accessibility regulations and the whys, because it, it's so important to know why. Why would you care about how big a door is or how much clearance there is around the door? Well, it makes a difference to some of us. So there's basic building blocks that we talk about that are required um, and that set up sort of the good um, plan to make a project accessible. So the first thing you wanna think about is how people are gonna come to your building. Uh, they might be coming off the sidewalk. They might be coming from parking, from mass transit, from ride share. Everywhere that people are coming to your project, is there an accessible route from that location? Um, can they move safely and comfortably from that drop-off spot to the front door? And then thinking about how much space does a wheelchair user take up? And we talk about sort of the footprint of wheelchair users as being 30 inches wide by 48 inches long. It's also really important to remember that it's actually a volume, that you're thinking about the box that is required for people to maneuver. And in this case, we're seeing images here of the box of the, the imaginary box that is needed for someone to have enough room to open a door while using a wheelchair. The other thing that you see over and over again in the code is how do people turn around and how much space does that take? Well, you can either use a 60 inch circle or you can use this sort of complicated T-turn. Remember that I talked about how um, scooters, those mobility devices with a little tiller in the front, they have a terrible turning radius. They turn like a car. You have to make like a three point turn. Um, most uh, manual and wheelchairs, you can turn on a dime. You can spin right in a circle, but not all devices do that. So it's super important to remember that these are the minimums. So if you're gonna design a, a bathroom or an, a small office, think about the fact that the code tells you you must have a certain size turning radius, but in this case, more is better. And then <clears throat> if you're going to interact with a device or a fixture or a, like a plumbing fixture, whether it's a sink um, in your office kitchen or this, um, a sink in a public toilet room, you need to have room for someone's knees to slide underneath. 
And that's what this image here is. And you also need a little bit further depth for somebody's toes. And so when we talk about knee and toe clearance, that's kind of what we're talking about. And it's also important to recognize that as people who use mobility devices um, come up against something, we want to reach a control, a light switch, uh, the button on a microwave, or um, the um, faucet handle at your bathroom sink, we have to be able to reach that. And our reach, can't really see because I'm realizing that I'm so close to the camera, our reach is an arc, right? So the closer you can bring something to you, uh, closer to your body, the higher you can reach. But if you have to reach way out over an obstruction, you're not gonna be able to reach very far. So those are sort of the basic things to keep in mind. But you're gonna look up the numbers, right? At ada.gov. The other thing to think about is not just, we talked about this, is not just about wheelchair users, but about creating a zone of safety for people who are moving through the building, in particular for people in the blindness and low vision community. So we don't want anything sticking out where someone's gonna bump into it inadvertently. If you're using a white cane, you're gonna be sweeping that cane back and forth in an effort to find any kinds of obstructions. If something is no greater than four inches from the wall, you're not likely to bump into it. If something is greater than four inches from the wall, you want that to be down low so that it's in a, a zone that a cane can reach. And of course, you, you want to be very careful of anything that uh, might be an obstruction at head height. It's important to think about the surface that people are moving over, both to aid people who use mobility devices and to prevent trip hazards. Many of us, as we get older, find it's um, little by little, it's more difficult to lift our feet when we walk. Sometimes people talk about that as um, uh, older folks shuffling, but really it's just a mechanism of age change in our bodies. Um, and so we are looking at trying to prevent any um, high vertical changes and that make sure that everything above that one quarter inch mark is beveled or, or ramped. Again, it's about safety. All right, let's talk. By the way, did you know people with disabilities drive? Um, I, this is an important section to me because I drive a modified van like this one. And boy, it is really hard to get accessible parking in my neighborhood at least. So important for you to recognize that this is the international symbol of access, little wheelchair guy. Um, this is an important part of accessible signage. And it's also important for you to know, as many of you I'm sure are drivers, is to know that accessible parking and the designated access aisle are there for people who have particular mobility needs. So leave it to them, please. When you do accessible parking, that access aisle, that hatched space adjacent to the parking space must connect to an accessible route. It is anticipated that people who use mobility devices or people with disabilities themselves would be getting out of their vehicle on that hatch space and they need to move directly into an accessible um, entrance or onto an accessible route. Now, the code is gonna tell you if you have a parking space with this many cars, this many need to be accessible spaces. So there's a difference between an accessible space and a van accessible space. So we know that um, for every um, six accessible spaces, one needs to be a van space, which means that the very first space that you provide must be a van space. Then you can provide five other, up to five other 
standard accessible spaces. And then your next space has got to be a van space. And you can add up to five. That goes on from there. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, well, this one, <laughs> this slide references Washington. So I don't know exactly what's in your state. But in our state, the parking spaces must be eight feet wide. And the access aisle must be on the same level. That means you can't have the access aisle up on a curb. It has to be at the same level as the parking space. And the space in the access aisle must be level, not on a hill. It needs to be level. What makes the difference between a standard space and a van space? Really, it's the size of the access aisle. Um, a car space, a standard space is five feet, the access aisle. A van is um, eight feet, so that the total space allowed for a van is eight feet for the vehicle and eight feet for getting out of the car. And you must have signage. And <clears throat> you must have signage that is mounted up high, at least 60 inches off the ground, so that it can be seen over a standard car. And um, it must, it can be mounted hung from the ceiling of a parking garage, it can be on a wall, it can be on a post, any number of things, but it needs to be at the head of the parking space. And um, if you have a van accessible space, it must have the words van accessible on it. Pretty easy, right? So then, so now we've parked, let's go inside the building um, or let's get to the building, I guess I should say. So we'll talk about the accessible route outside of the building. So level is defined as one to 48 or less. Anything up to one and 20 in slope is really just a sloped walking surface. Greater than one and 20 is a ramp and ramps are required to have uh, landings and other things like that. It's important for you to know when you design your environments that the shallower slopes are easier to use and that you need to um, provide um, you need to provide places for people to rest if they're going long distances. And one of the reasons I love this image um, here is this is a switchback ramp that you can kind of see in the middle of that grassy um, spot that there's a set of stairs in there. And this is the alternative route to going up the stairs. Uh, but the edges of this route are set at about 18 inches high, which would mean it's a perfect place for someone to sit and rest who maybe is a slow walker. The other thing that is super important to really um, pay attention to is cross slope. And um, you wanna keep the cross slope down to the absolute bare minimum. Um, it, it really impacts the ability for, especially people with freewheeling mobility devices um, to, be, um, to be able to effectively navigate slopes. So keep your cross slope down to less than 2%. And don't have openings in the accessible route. Look at the size of that grate. And as you can see, it's the route from accessible parking to the front door on that nice little, um, you know, striped walkway. Ah! So keep your openings less than a half inch. Uh, wouldn't let like a, a marble greater than a half inch fall through and that they are oriented perpendicular to the path of travel. So, and pay attention, you know, concrete shifts. And you can see in the image on the left, part of the reason we have that almost one inch door threshold change is because the, the paving outside dropped and um, certainly tree heave makes a big difference. So thinking about keeping your sidewalks and your walkways as smooth as possible. So let's get in the door. 60% of your entrances, including the main entrance, must be accessible. I am so sad to tell you that on that image on the left, 
is a restaurant that was built not five years ago with that huge set of stairs up the front door. Really, like I, I was stunned. Um, what we're looking for is more like what you're seeing on the right, where you have a smooth um, level entry into a building. Automated door controls are, they may not be required in your state at front doors, but boy, are they a customer service benefit. So I encourage you to have power operators at the front door at least, and maybe in other locations as well. And where do you locate that operator? You locate it in such a way that if someone pulls up next to it, they're not going to be in the path of the door swinging open. So make sure that they're not gonna get hit by the door as it opens. And remember we talked about that reach over objects? Oh, this was a real doozy of a door opener. Over, I think, was the heating and ventilation system. Oh. Um, we talked a little bit about creating that zone of safety. This is actually a really nice solution to what happens when you have an open stair, putting a bench or other sort of um, feature under the stair to pr protect people. Um, one of the biggest uh, protruding objects are drinking fountains. And they are often sort of a last minute addition kind of thrown in there. And uh, this particular uh, drinking fountain on the right not only is a protruding object in the corridor, but it also obstructs the door um, opening clearance to that bathroom. So it's kind of a double whammy. Let's talk about toilet rooms really quickly. You know, I think many architects think that a toilet room is a super easy um, space to design. I beg to differ, very complicated. And if this is something that you get to do when you're new to accessible design, um, I really hope that you pay a lot of time and attention to it. So first of all, all toilet rooms in public spaces, all of them must be accessible. Um, there are a few exceptions, but in, in the generally, that's what you need to think about. Every toilet room is gonna be accessible. Um, and it must have um, at least one of every fixture that is accessible. So sink, toilet, urinal, uh, if there are multiples. Um, that, and you have to have grab bars installed and turning space in the restroom. So, and then there's the toilet accessories. This is a very standard toilet room in my area. It's important to realize this is one area where the ADA and the building codes sometimes differ a little bit. So the ADA tells us you have to have grab bars around the toilet, long ones on the side of the toilet and somewhat shorter ones behind it. But um, if your state is like mine, it also requires a vertical grab bar over the sidewall. That is not required by the ADA. It is a common uh, building code requirement, however. So this would be a case where this would be more stringent and would still be required if you're doing um, a, a new uh, public accommodation in your state. So, okay, just really quickly, don't put accessories over the accessible uh, water closet. You can't reach them. So, I mean, the only person who can reach that seat cover dispenser is someone already sitting on the potty. And boy, that's kind of against the nature of it. So make sure that you locate those elsewhere in the stall. There's plenty of room to do that. Um, you are supposed to pay attention to mounting things so that people can still use the grab bars. So that means you need 12 inches above the grab bar for, um, for mounting things on the wall above or an inch and a half below. That allows people enough room to put their hands around the grab bar, rest their elbow in the crook between the grab bar and the wall and um, use the grab bars for leverage. And that goes for the rear uh, location as well. Um, the toilet stall door is required to have loop handles on both sides. 
Now, most people put the loop handle on both sides near the latch. And that, that's, you know, reasonable. But I want to suggest that there's an even better way to do it. And that is, instead of having the loop handle out here by the latch, on the inside, on the pull side, put the loop handle near the door hinge. Because when you're going through that door and now you're sitting in here inside the stall, it is really hard to reach all the way out here to that loop. But it's very close to reach the hinge. So just think about that. Um, when you have soap dispensers, very common for people to put the soap dispenser on the rear wall along with the mirrors. That is the hardest place to reach because you have to belly up to the sink and then lean all the way and try to make it to that soap dispenser. What I love about this image, I mean, it's a public pool, so it's kind of industrial looking, is that they chose to add another soap dispenser down here on the side. This works great for folks with limited reach, children, folks with short stature, really a great option. Why do we put everything in exactly the same place throughout the whole toilet room? Doesn't need to be. Think about it, think outside the box. Um, I wanted to show you this image of mirror placement. There are rules about the height of mirrors. And I think when you're a tall person, you probably don't have any clue that it really does matter how low that, that mirror is. When I'm sitting in my chair and, I, and there's a compliant mirror that meets the requirements, the image I see is the one on the right. It's sort of from here up. The image on the left is a mirror where they put the bottom of the frame at the compliant height, but then it's a nice big thick decorative frame. I can't see anything in there. And so I wanted you to see how significant it is to follow the rules by the words in the text. With the, the words in the text say that the bottom of the reflecting surface should be at a certain height. And then there's like things like the paper towel dispenser and the trash receptacle. Um, these big giant paper towel dispensers, when you just mount that thing on the wall up at, you know, 40 inches or something, now all of a sudden it's a protruding object, right? It's not detectable for someone in the blindness community. So what are ways to solve that problem? Well, you can semi-recess the big dispenser you can put a permanently mounted trash can below it so that the difference between the edge of the trash can and the paper towel dispenser is not more than four inches. Uh, let's talk really quickly about showers. Um, I love the shower on the right. It's uh, very accessible for a couple of reasons. One is that it meets the diagram down below, recognizing that um, when you are going to transfer from a wheelchair onto the bench, you need to have this extra space um, behind you to fit your wheels. So this has the clearance that's required aligned with the seat, an adjustable height shower head, grab bars, and you guys, a shower curtain. So this is awesome. This gives you the privacy you need and you can enclose your wheelchair in there. So you have some privacy. What would have been even better is if there had been a shower curtain right here too, so your chair doesn't get wet. That would be awesome. Um, signage is a, a very important feature for people uh, with disabilities in the blindness and low vision community. The important thing to know about signage that's tactile, so raised letters and braille, is you gotta be absolutely uniform in where you put them. The ADA tells us that the signage must be located in relationship to the door handle. So person who is looking for a space would find the door, find the door handle, and then they know, okay, the sign is going to be placed adjacent to that. Um, and if it's important that it be regular, predictable um, location and at a predictable height throughout the facility. And don't forget, don't place it right next to the door jam, because many people, especially when the door opens towards you, 
is because many people in the blindness and low vision community need to be able to put their face very close to the sign in order to utilize what residual um, sight they do have. And you certainly wouldn't want someone standing right up close to the sign and have the door open because and have them get hit. So I, I think I ran over just a little bit, but I want to ask like, what have you learned? Hopefully enough to now consider that accessibility regulations are not so much of a burden, but a more of an opportunity to improve people's lives. So, you know, I think that design is a social justice issue. And this is our opportunity to like make everybody involved in our community. So choose to be an access advocate. Everyone wants to live a full life. So thank you so much um, for the opportunity to talk. And now um, let's see, I'm gonna turn it back to Maggie. Okay. Let me see. Uh, let me see. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, Karen. Thank you so much for such uh, inspiring and, and very informative and fascinating lecture. Um, a lot of the our students are really going to try to recall all these as they take their ARE exam. You know, there's a lot of these. Uh, accessibility code requirements uh, that will probably show up there to get their licensure. What was really impressive and really uh, inspired me is that the series of projects that showed how you can take the code instead of being a burden. And actually, I did a survey in my studio just a couple of weeks ago about what do you think when you hear the word code or zoning requirements, right? Are these things that cripple you or you can take it and be really use really challenge your creativity, right? Um, so uh, my my first question would be, what do you think? At what stage of the project development do you think the ADA guidelines should be start to be Im implemented? You know the schematic design, concept design, DD. Usually we see this towards the end when you're about to submit it for uh, uh, like this uh, to get uh, the paperwork signed right by the city. Uh, city council, but from what I've seen today in your in your uh, some of your examples, that that didn't seem like something happened as an afterthought. It seems it's happened way early on. So, um, can you elaborate on that? Or tell us what what's the perfect timing to really start implementing some of these creative ideas? So, I would argue that accessibility needs to be a core value in the design of your project. So. We recognize that our clients come to us with, um, with particular project parameters, goals that they have for the project. Um, and I would argue that, that the inclusion of all users needs to be one of those primary goals, whether the owner directly uh, suggests that or not, that um, as architects, our job is to um, protect the health, safety, and welfare of all of our community members. And that includes making sure that accessibility is um, an initial consideration. And one of the reasons why I think it's super important to think about it from the beginning. So Seattle, if anybody's been here, is a very hilly community. So when you are placing your building on the site at the very beginning, it's important to think about the placement and the relationship of where, how people are going to get to the building and making, for example, the building entrance on the least sloped part of the site or um, utilizing the contours in a way uh, that um, make the project more accessible. And if you wait it to the you know, in the middle of construction documents to think about that, it's way too late. So you really need to start at the very beginning. Right, especially with site development design, right? Like how you access the site to start with, right? Um, yeah. uh, that will get me to the next question. Would, how do you think we can increase the awareness of the ADA requirements, especially in academia, where 
majority of the project developed in own conceptual level, right? And you hear about the ADA maybe in technology classes, but not necessarily the studio. Is that correct? Yeah. Like ways um, of, yeah. So, um, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just learning about what the, what the sort of pressures are on architecture school to ensure that students have um, a thorough and complete education. But I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that understanding um, accessibility, inclusive design, universal design, whatever you guys want to, is, is an important and core uh, value for um, getting a design education. And I think can be incorporated into any design project. Um, I had the opportunity to work with some students at a local university. Um, they were doing a multifamily housing project. In, in the real world, in multifamily housing, only a certain percentage of each dwelling units are required to be accessible. But the students were asking, well, why couldn't I make all of them accessible? And I'm like, you know what, when it's, when you're doing schoolwork, you could. And so now is the time to like, to stretch those muscles and play with that when you don't have a client standing over you going, it's gonna cost too much money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember like many years ago, maybe over 15 years ago, when I first was introduced to the, um, the ADA exercise, uh, I was tasked to design a, 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 um, a restaurant. So. I didn't know about all the radiuses and then I made all the table size in between them. There's always have the radius. And then my professor said, it seems you're trying to be nice to someone. It's only at the corner where you need to turn, but it, but it was, he said, you need to add more customers to that. To that. But that, that's actually a good, a good example how you can, in, in academia, we, we have a really a rigorous technology courses where there's a major section of our uh, course covers the ADA uh, requirements and uh, the students will be tasked with doing an assignment to try to make sure that um, the stairwell accessibility and also the bathrooms and, and thing and all these uh, technical are being embedded into the drawings. Um, so I want to remind uh, the attendees that you can type your question in the Q&A feature. We, you guys don't have access to the chat, but you can write the questions in the Q&A. And there's a question uh, from um, uh, Amanda Foster. She was asking that, can you talk a little bit more about the United States Access Board and your role in it? And what's the broader idea of that? Sure. Um, so the US Access Board is an independent federal agency that is uh, charged with developing the accessibility regulations for the federal government. And I'm sorry, the accessibility guidelines for the federal government. And they wrote the original Uniform Federal Accessibility Standard and they ended up writing the um, accessibility guidelines that were then adopted by the Department of Justice as the ADA um, standards. Um, our, um, I've been serving on the board since 2010, so it's been 10 years, and one of the most rewarding um, experiences is that it's a community of the board members, uh, our 50% of them are either people with disabilities or people that re represent uh, organizations of, of people with disabilities. And the other half of the board are uh, members of our sister agencies, like the Department of Health and Human Services or the Department of Interiors or the Department of Defense. And the idea is that we're all working together to develop um, information about the best practices on accessibility um, that can be potentially implemented. Uh, unfortunately, we all know that the federal government moves very slowly in developing new regulation. So it's been, and, and our last administration was um, uh, not interested in new regulation. So it's been quite a while since we've been able to make change, um, but our current administration is now allowing us to do more work. And so we're super excited to be back and, and kind of rolling again. 
Yeah, very glad to hear that. We, we have also a, a question by one of our students, actually, uh, she was my student for over two years. So Mary Catherine McGovern was asking, which design strategy is, uh, actually, which design strategy is more preferred? Uh, is it a zigzagging pivot, pivot uh, pathway sloping upward or a long stretch ramp? And which type of ramps are desired and which are cause for frustration? Which one can cause frustration? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's an interesting question because I think some of this um, depends on uh, the steepness of the ramp. So there's nothing inherently wrong with a switchback, which, you know, which is you would zigzag that you might say. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, if it's a very steep switchback and a very narrow one, it can feel um, as though you're kind of enclosed by walls and so I would think more about what's, what's the overall experience of moving through that space or a, trying to get from that one location up or down to another location and, and really try to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's, who's you know, rolling it or whatever. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of shallower and longer. I, I think that anytime you're doing a ramp, if you have more length and a lower slope, it's better, uh, easier to use and easier to construct to be accessible. Um, so that would be my preference. Um, I, I do wanna say that if you're trying to go like a full flight, maybe nine feet or something, that's a really long, hard push up for someone who uses a manual chair. So I would hope that you would not substitute a ramp for an elevator in that kind of level change. Yeah, yeah. actually I remember uh, one of uh, my uh, friend's architect, he was studying in the University of Arizona and then one of the assignments that they had to spend a day on a wheelchair, that's mm -hmm. the and then they tried to figure out can you really, how many places on campus can access? Can you go to your apartment and come back? And how sometimes you were crossing the road and then how they figure out that, oh, there's a paver that doesn't have a ramp. So they had to actually stand up and carry the wheelchair and take a note of that, that place I can't, I can't access to it. So you had to, and how long does it take? So some of these uh, hands-on, which I think something I encourage in my classes, like the dynamic learning or active learning, like what do you really do hands-on? And you can't really, um, from description and talking and drawings and seeing all these relations, it's the best understood by being in that person, not choose in this case, you by a person seat and try to see, can you go from point A to point B? And this is how you should really apply that as you design your building. I think we got another time for another question. Okay, from uh, Audrey Bader. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for this informative lecture. I'm curious if digital drafting techniques have been better accessibility in architecture and uh, or better and not better than accessibility in architecture. And do you see opportunities for digital drafting to push accessibility further to the forefront in academia or practice? Do you, okay, I'm going to assume that the question is around does using um, like CAD or other digital um, software techniques make being an architect for a person with disability easier rather than does it change the outcome, the design work? Because I, I think of our digital design tools, they're just tools and no different than, you know, when I went to school, I used, I used pen and ink <laughs> back in the old days. Um, and, but so, so you should be using whatever tool allows you to express yourself. But yes, do I think that the idea of doing everything on the computer now, does it make it easier for people who maybe have manual dexterity issues? Absolutely. Um, when I, just as to tell a story, I, I, I mentioned that my classmates made me a lower drafting table. Well, in those days we were working on sheets of 
mylar or paper that were 48 inches wide, this was huge. And just being able to pick up that sheet of paper and move it around was really hard for me. The idea now of being able to do that, like on a computer screen, it's like brilliant. So even though I don't have manual dexterity issues, um, I think that I find it much easier today uh, to be an architect. And I think that the essential, uh, the, 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 the aptitude that you need to be an architect is the idea of being able to visualize three-dimensionally, kind of come up with the ideas in your head for that thing that you want to build and translate that using one of these tools or whatever to a language that a contractor can read, right? So we're, we might be using 3D imagery, we might be using CAD drafting, maybe you're actually drawing by hand, but you're still trying to translate that using this language of plans and sections and elevations and stuff. And I, I think there are lots of people who may have been dissuaded from the profession because somebody thought, oh, you know, you wouldn't be able to get out onto a construction site because you use a wheelchair or maybe it's hard for you to, to draw using holding a pencil. Well, those should not be limits. It's all about what you can imagine. Well, um, Karen, thank you so much. We're getting to the, towards the end of our lecture and uh, Thank you for a fascinating presentation and really an eye opener, uh, especially with all these uh, clever solutions that we presented. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to meet with you in other times we in person and we'll be having dinner after lecture. So I hope uh, one day our road will cross again and uh, our path will cross again and we get to have you in person uh, when things uh, are better. Situation. But, Thanks again for your time and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, well, it was my pleasure. And I really, I want to say, you know, that I look forward to all those students uh, going out into the world and being better architects. So thank you. Have thank you. Bye.